Ramzi Ahmed Youssef was part of some of the most ambitious terrorist conspiracies discovered to date, including a plot to blow up 11 airliners over the Pacific Ocean. His most infamous act, the bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993, marked a new era in global terrorism. From an engineering student in the United Kingdom to one of the world's most notorious terrorists, this is the story of Ramzi Youssef. Abdul Basit Mahmoud Abdul Karim is the birth name of Ramzi Youssef. Born in Kuwait on April 27, 1968, his parents originated from Pakistan. It's widely believed that his mother is the sibling of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, a Pakistani terrorist and former Al-Qaeda propaganda chief who is infamous for orchestrating the 9-11 attacks. In the mid-1980s, his family returned to Pakistan. Youssef moved to the United Kingdom to pursue his education. He began his studies in electrical engineering at Swansea Institute in Wales in 1986, completing his degree in 1990. He also attended the Oxford College of Further Education to improve his English. After his education, Youssef returned to Kuwait, but left following the Iraqi invasion in 1990, eventually reaching Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, he was trained in bomb making to plan an attack within the United States. He also connected with the Abu Sayyaf group in the Philippines to expand their influence. Youssef entered the United States on September 1, 1992, using a fake Iraqi passport and claiming political asylum. Accompanying him was Ahmed Ajaj, who was caught with several immigration documents, including a forged Swedish passport. Ajaj was arrested following the discovery of bomb-making guides, a guide on how to lie to U.S. immigration officials, and videos of car bombers were found in his luggage. His arrest unintentionally helped Yusuf's entry as it created a distraction among the authorities. Yusuf, who claimed to be Abdul Basit Mahmoud Abdul Karim from Pakistan, was detained for questioning for three days in overcrowded INS facilities and was later issued a temporary passport by the Pakistani consulate in New York. While in New York City, Youssef met Omar Abdel Rahman, a radical cleric from Egypt. With Rahman's assistance, Youssef assembled the resources and people necessary to carry out the World Trade Center bombing. Youssef's primary objective was to cause the North Tower of the World Trade Center to collapse into the South Tower, resulting in an estimate of over 200,000 casualties in revenge for the United States' support for Israel against Palestine. He conducted detailed reconnaissance of the target, understanding the structure and vulnerabilities of the World Trade Center. Youssef recruited a small group of accomplices, including Mohammed Salameh, Mahmoud Abu Halima, and Nidal Ayyad. This team was crucial in acquiring materials and executing the plan. He also received financial and logistical support from his uncle, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Over the course of several months, Youssef and his team gathered the necessary materials for the bomb. They rented a storage locker in New Jersey, where they stockpiled chemicals and other bomb-making materials. The bomb consisted of a urea nitrate main charge enhanced with compressed hydrogen gas tanks to increase the power of the explosion. Youssef and his team purchased chemicals like urea and nitric acid, commonly used in agricultural operations, to avoid suspicion. The bomb was then assembled in the rented storage locker. It was a massive device, weighing about 1,200 pounds. The assembly process required careful handling and knowledge of chemistry to avoid premature detonation. Youssef created a complex ignition system using a Casio watch as a timer to trigger the explosion. The bomb was then placed in a yellow rider rental van. On February 26, 1993, Youssef and his team drove the van to a local Shell gas station where they filled up the tank to add one last explosive touch. The van was then driven into the underground parking garage beneath the North Tower of the World Trade Center. After parking the van in a strategic location on the underground B2 level to maximize structural damage, Youssef ignited the fuse and left the scene immediately 
with his accomplice, Ayad Ismoil. They headed to the JFK airport driven by Mahmoud Salame, where Youssef escaped back to Pakistan on falsified travel documents, and Ismail flew home to Jordan. Salame, however, was left without enough money to buy a plane ticket. Salome had a ticket to Amsterdam, which continued to Ammon, but it was an infant ticket. While Salome had been able to use this ticket to get himself a Dutch visa, he could not actually travel on it. Needing more money for an adult fare, he tried to get his van deposit back by telling the rental agency that the van had been stolen. The bomb detonated at 12.18 p.m., creating a force estimated at 150,000 PSI. This explosion carved out a hole roughly 100 feet wide, penetrating through four levels of concrete. The bomb's detonation speed was approximately 15,000 feet per second. It immediately severed the World Trade Center's primary electrical supply, disabling the emergency lighting. Smoke from the explosion ascended to the 93rd floor of both towers, filling stairwells and elevators, making evacuation challenging, and causing numerous cases of smoke inhalation. Youssef wanted the smoke to remain in the tower, slowly suffocating the occupants to death. The power outage trapped hundreds in the tower's elevators, including a group of 17 kindergarten children stuck for five hours between the 35th and 36th floors of the South Tower. The bombing resulted in six fatalities, including five Port Authority workers, one of whom was expecting, and a businessman who had parked his car in the garage. In the ensuing evacuation, over a thousand individuals were injured. Among these, 15 suffered traumatic injuries from the explosion, and 20 reported heart-related issues. Additionally, one firefighter was hospitalized, and injuries were sustained by 87 firefighters, 35 police officers, and one EMS personnel during the emergency response. While the tower did not fall as Youssef planned, the explosion caused extensive damage to the garage. Response teams from the ATF, FBI, and NYPD, including agents and bomb experts, quickly arrived at the scene for investigation. During their search in the debris of the underground parking, a bomb technician discovered fragments of the vehicle's internal components that carried the bomb. A piece of an axle with a vehicle identification number provided essential clues, leading them to a rider van rented from Dib Leasing in Jersey City. The rental records showed Mohammed Salome as the renter. Salome, having falsely reported the van as stolen, was apprehended by the authorities when he came to reclaim his deposit on March 4, 1993. The capture of Salame guided the authorities to Abdul Rahman Yassin's residence in Jersey City, New Jersey, an apartment he shared with his mother in the same building as Ramzi Youssef. Yassin was brought to the FBI's Newark field office in Newark, New Jersey, but was released. The following day, he departed for Iraq. Later, Yassin was indicted for his role in the attack, and in 2001, he was added to the FBI's initial most wanted terrorists list where he continues to be listed as of the time of this recording. Following the arrests of Salome and Yassin, investigators were led to Ramzi Youssef's apartment. There, they uncovered materials for bomb making and a business card belonging to Mohammed Jamal Khalifa, who was also later arrested. Youssef was placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list for his role in the bombing. Upon his return to Pakistan, in February 1993, Youssef concealed his whereabouts. Just five months later, he was involved in a failed assassination attempt on Pakistani Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto. The following year, he is believed to have been involved in the bombing of a Shiite religious shrine in Iran that killed 25 people. Upon his return to Metro Manila, Youssef was greeted by Islamist representatives who proposed he target U.S. President Bill Clinton scheduled to visit the Philippines on November 12, 1994. Yusuf considered various assassination methods, including planting bombs along Clinton's motorcade route, using a Stinger missile against Air Force One or the presidential limo, firing ballistic missiles at Manila, or employing Foskine, 
a chemical weapon. Ultimately, he dismissed these plans as they were deemed too challenging, but integrated the concept of assassinating the Pope into what was became known as the Bojinka Plot. The Bojinka Plot was a large-scale, multi-phase terrorist plan by Youssef and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Phase one of the Bojinka Plot involved the assassination of Pope John Paul II during his visit to the Philippines for World Youth Day in January 1995. The plan involved disguising a bomber as a priest during Pope John Paul II's motorcade on his way to the San Carlos Seminary in Makati. The bomber's objective was to approach the Pope and trigger the explosive. Prior to January 1995, Youssef had trained around 20 individuals to execute this plot. Phase two, and the most notorious aspect of the plot, was to bomb 11 US-bound airliners from Asia over the Pacific Ocean simultaneously. The bombers intended to use liquid explosives hidden in bottles. They planned to board and plant the bombs on the planes, which were then set to explode in midair over the Pacific Ocean, potentially killing approximately 4,000 passengers and crew and shutting down air travel around the world. The final phase of the plot was to crash an airplane, likely a small aircraft or a hijacked commercial airliner into the headquarters of the Central Intelligence Agency in Langley, Virginia. Ramsey Youssef prepared for the Bojinka plot by conducting several test bombings to ensure the efficacy and stealth of his bomb-making techniques. The most significant test conducted by Youssef was on Philippine Airlines Flight 434 on December 11, 1994. Youssef boarded the flight from Manila to Cebu with a stopover in Tokyo. He planted a bomb under a seat and then disembarked at Cebu, leaving the bomb on the plane. The bomb was constructed using a small amount of liquid nitroglycerin concealed in a contact lens solution bottle. It was connected to a Casio digital watch used as a timer set to detonate on the next leg of the flight from Cebu to Tokyo. The explosion occurred killing a Japanese businessman and injuring several other passengers, but the plane managed an emergency landing. Prior to the Philippine Airlines test, Youssef conducted smaller scale experiments. One such test involved detonating a small bomb in a mall in Manila, Philippines. This was to understand the impact of his bomb making materials and techniques in a controlled, less catastrophic environment. Youssef also experimented with car bombs in the Philippines. These tests were likely part of his broader research into effective bomb making and were instrumental in refining the types of explosives and detonation mechanisms he planned to use. The plot was foiled in January 1995 when a chemical fire drew attention to Youssef's Manila apartment where police found evidence of the planned attacks, including bomb making materials and detailed plans the discovery of the Bojinka plot led to increased security measures in airports worldwide, especially concerning liquid explosives. This plot later inspired the planning of the 9-11 attacks, with the idea of using aircraft as weapons in the United States. Youssef fled Manila for Pakistan, and on January 31, 1995, he traveled from Pakistan to Thailand, where he met with his South African associate, Istaik Parker. Youssef instructed Parker to place two bomb-laden suitcases on flights operated by Delta Airlines and United Airlines, set to detonate over densely populated areas in the U.S. Despite spending considerable time at the airport, Parker was too frightened to deliver the suitcases to the airlines. Eventually, Parker returned to Youssef's hotel, falsely claiming that airline cargo staff were demanding passports and fingerprints, thus making the plan too hazardous to proceed. Youssef, still determined to plant the bombs on a US-bound plane, contacted a friend in Qatar with diplomatic immunity who agreed to transport the suitcases to London and check them onto a flight to the US. The intention was for the bombs to explode mid-flight, destroying the aircraft. Youssef aimed to leverage his friend's diplomatic status to ensure the suitcases were loaded onto the plane. However, there was an unknown problem, and the suitcases were never checked in, 
leading Yusuf and Parker to return to Pakistan on February 2nd, 1995. Ramzi Yusuf's arrest was a significant event in the fight against international terrorism. Acting on information provided by Istaik Parker on February 7, 1995, operatives from Pakistan's Inter-Services Intelligence, along with U.S. Diplomatic Security Service Special Agents, stormed Room 16 at the Sukasa Guest House in Islamabad, Pakistan. They apprehended Yusef before he could escape to Peshawar. The raiding team discovered flight schedules for Delta and United Airlines, as well as bomb-making materials hidden in children's toys in the room. Yusef notably had chemical burn marks on his fingers. Following his arrest, Yusef was extradited to the United States to face charges. His trial in the U.S. was highly publicized and closely watched worldwide. He faced multiple charges, including bombing the World Trade Center in 1993 and plotting the Bojinka plot. During his trial, Yusef maintained a defiant attitude, showing no remorse for his actions. He made several statements that revealed his mindset and justifications for the terrorist acts he committed. Youssef stated that the World Trade Center bombing was in retaliation for American support of Israel and its policies towards Palestine. He justified his actions as a form of resistance against what he perceived as American aggression and oppression in the Middle East. He showed a lack of remorse for the victims of the bombings. He callously remarked that the real victims were the people of Palestine and Iraq and he tried to rationalize the World Trade Center bombing and other plots as a response to the suffering of these people. Most infamously, at his sentencing, Youssef stated, quote, I am a terrorist, and I am proud of it. For his crimes, Ramzi Youssef received two life sentences plus 240 years. The judge in his case ordered that his prison time should be, quote, as harsh and as difficult as possible. He also recommended that Yusef's entire sentence be served in solitary confinement. Yusef has been serving his sentence in the United States in the high security supermax prison in Florence, Colorado, known as ADX Florence. This facility houses inmates in solitary confinement for 23 hours a day, with minimal human contact and extremely strict security measures. Yusef is kept under constant surveillance and has very limited access to the outside world. His communication with family or others is highly restricted and monitored, though at one point, Youssef did befriend two other high-profile inmates occupying neighboring prison cells, Oklahoma City bomber Timothy McVeigh and the Una bomber Ted Kaczynski. The life and crimes of Ramzi Youssef have created an unforgettable imprint on historical events. It's crucial to remember the innocent lives lost and affected by these heinous acts, and to acknowledge the resilience of communities that have rebuilt and moved forward in the face of adversity. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay updated on future video releases. I appreciate your support and encourage you to share your thoughts and perspectives in the comments below.